Well, good morning. Um, wow, it is so, so very good to see you. Um, and I'm also kind of nervous because there's so many people here. <laughs> but what a blessing it is to see you. And uh, why don't we just start with prayer and then I will make a few announcements and uh, then we'll just move right on with our service. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do uh, just entrust ourselves to you. It is a great privilege to gather together with your people, and we recognize how much we have missed that because of the last two months. And so, Lord, I ask that you would just especially make this a rich time of sweet worship and good fellowship, even as we have to kind of keep our distance from one another. I just pray, oh God, that you would especially pour out your grace and blessing on this morning. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, I believe that uh, we have recognized over the last couple of months what social creatures we really are, haven't we? Uh, so the last service that we had here in this room as Community Bible Church, um, not recorded, was um, March the 15th. And so uh, it is a blessing and a privilege to see you here on May the 17th. And of course, we send our greetings out to everybody who's going to be watching this tomorrow on the video. A um, <clears throat> couple of announcements. Uh, one is, uh, please be praying for our elders and deacons. Uh, we do have a meeting on Tuesday evening, and we're going to just have to uh, wrestle with uh, some of the uh, changes that we're having to make because of what our nation and our world is facing with COVID-19. Uh, but also pray for us because we realize we're very much reacting in real time or responding in real time to what is happening. Uh, we can't really make plans very far out in the future. So please pray for uh, the leadership of our church as we try to serve you in the best way possible. And also we're grateful for this opportunity to meet together, but we also recognize, I think all of us recognize, that if uh, the number of cases of COVID-19 rapidly increases, um, over the next few weeks that we'll have to make changes yet again. So let's be grateful for the opportunities that God has given to us. And then uh, women's Bible study. So uh, just kind of a, a change from the email that was sent out. Jenny's decided that they're going to do, or you are going to do women's Bible study here in the auditorium um, just so that people can spread out and kind of feel comfortable that it can be face-to-face -face instead of over Zoom. So uh, women's Bible study will happen. It will happen face-to-face. -face, and the details are otherwise still the same in the email as far as the start date. And you do need to sign up. You do need to let Jenny know if you would like for a book to be ordered for you. But that's the, what normally would be the summer uh, back porch Bible study or front porch Bible study will be here in the auditorium. Well, this is the Lord's Day. And it is our great privilege and responsibility on this day to worship Jesus Christ as our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, let's worship Him together. So why don't you stand with me? The worship team is going to come, and we'll sing together, um, starting with 10,000 reasons. <laughs> well, good morning. Um, it's good to see all of you. Um, I just wanted to start with reading a passage from Psalm chapter 34. Verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to exalt the name of the Lord together by singing 10,000 reasons.
everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior. The
Well, it, it has been good for me to see you today. It's brought tears to my eyes to uh, worship together once again. Uh, but it also, uh, you know, just driving through town and noticing a couple of other churches that are gathering for face-to-face -face services. Um, I knew it was going to be an emotional day um, for me, just kind of choking up seeing other churches that are, that are going to meet together. And uh, It is a tremendous, tremendous blessing. And uh, God bless you for being here. And certainly we want to express to those that aren't here today, um, but will be joining us by video, uh, you know, we love you and we miss you and we understand um, during these unusual and unprecedented times. Well, it's also great to have some kids with us here in the service because, you know, I, I like to use you for the introductions to my sermons, right? So we've just got a few children that are here today, and uh, I hope that you're willing to speak up and speak out. Uh, to kind of answer some of my questions for the introduction here. So uh, the main question for the introduction, kids, is um, what is your favorite? What is your favorite children's group game? So uh, not a board game, not like a video game, but what is your favorite children's group game? Um, so um, you know, maybe I'll name off just like hide and seek. Is anybody like hide and seek is your favorite game? No, okay. Well, fine. Um, <laughs> so, um, I'll tell you a little game that we used to play at my house. Um, and we played this until it put us in the emergency room. So, um, we used to play this game, and this was just when we had Caleb and John. So they were pretty little back then. And this game was called Obey Daddy. And it was purely, purely for the purpose of running off steam. So we lived in a very small house, about 1,000 square feet in the suburbs of Chicago. And the idea was, I would say, go touch Daddy's pillow. And they would run down the hall. I would be in the living room. They would run down the hall. They would go touch the pillow on, on our bed. And then they would run back to me. And it was whoever could do the Obey Dad first, right? And then, you know, go climb on the top bunk. I don't think I ever did that one, but anyway, that would put you in the uh, emergency room, wouldn't it? And, you know, so it was go, go flush the toilet, and then they would run back, and, and it was just these different things that they would run, basically, it was running from one end of the house to the other, until there was kind of this accidental push, so um, I think Caleb was just kind of saving himself from falling down, and he ended up pushing John into a corner beat, so many of you know what a corner beat is, um, on a corner, an inside corner. Uh, of a house, or it's inside the house, but it's an outside corner. Anyway, and it split open John's forehead. He still wears that scar, I think, kind of proudly, but nevertheless, um, he still has that scar on his forehead, and that was that was the end of Obey Dad. But anyways, <laughs> so, um, but uh, boys and girls, what's your favorite uh, group game? So it needs to be something. Okay, go right here. Free tag. Free tag. All right. Awesome. Good deal? Yes, Sean? Drip, drip, drop. Drip, drip, drop, okay. Um, so drip, drip, drop is a version of duck, duck, goose that involves water. So you can imagine uh, what that's all about. Yes, Noah? Four square. Four square, yes, okay. Everybody give a big hoorah for four square. Hoorah! Okay. That could be, I think that could be called Community Bible Church four square, right? <laughs> all right, so, okay, yes, Hope? Dodgeball. Dodgeball. Do you really like dodgeball? Okay. All right. So, yeah. So, do you want to change your vote? Yeah. What is your soccer? Soccer. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I was thinking of not sport games, but go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Gaga ball. Yes. You know, I think that might be the Holy Spirit's leading for Community Bible Church to get some gaga ball. Wow. Amen. Gaga ball. <laughs> So you don't know what that is, do you? So it is a it is a really fun game. It's also sometimes called octoball. So there's a there's an octagon that's about three feet high of walls, and um, how about how wide? Maybe about 15 feet wide, and you bat a playground ball around, and if you get hit, you get out. And it's kind of a game of elimination. So it is a really awesome game. So that needs to go on the agenda for the deacons meeting on Sunday. That is such a fun game. All right. So go ahead, Miles. American Eagle. American Eagle, right. I can wear the proud badge of saying that I introduced that to our church, right? So American Eagle is a fun kind of freeze tag type game also. 
All right. Um, or it's an elimination game, maybe. All right. So anybody else? Any of the Owen kids want to say anything back there? No, not really. Okay. So in, any other? So so let's see. I had written down Red Rover. I guess I'm showing my age. All right. Okay. So all right. Um, heads up, seven up. Nobody. Nobody likes that. Okay. That's too too dumb. All right. Um, I did write down Duck Duck Goose. Uh, and Awana games, right? Don't we have some old, awesome Awana games, right? Yeah, those are those are all really great games. So, but also nobody mentioned nobody mentioned Follow the Leader, right? Maybe those are just too elementary. Maybe it's too preschool, right? Follow the Leader. But the reason I asked about your favorite games is because I wanted to finally get to Follow the Leader. Because who is the leader, boys and girls? Who is the ultimate leader that we should be following? Who is? Who is the leader we should be following? Yes, faith. God. Should be God. All right. And specifically for our message this morning, it should be Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the ultimate leader that we should be following. So why don't we turn in our Bibles to John, John chapter 21. John chapter 21. And uh, Jesus repeats this exhortation, or Jesus repeats this command uh, to follow him uh, at least twice as he is interacting with the Apostle Peter here at this point. So, um, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So that will be our focus this morning on following the Lord. Um, as most of you would know, I emailed out a handout if that's something that would be helpful for you. Maybe you can pull that up on your phone. Um, and I think there are a few that someone printed off there. In fact, if you would like to grab one of those, you can. So... Um, we're going to read starting in verses 18 and 19, and this is one of those messages where I'm just going to read a small section and preach the point, and then read the next section and preach that point, and then on we go. So, John chapter 21, beginning in verse number 18, and we'll read verses 18 and 19. So, you know uh, what happened in our message for last week, as last week we were uh, talking about Jesus' restoration of the Apostle Peter. So the Apostle Peter had denied him three times, and Jesus gave Peter the opportunity three times to declare his love. So he goes from denial to declaration of his love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that conversation continues on. So we, we took all of our time last week in verses 15 to 17 in that conversation with Jesus and Peter about his declaration of his love of Christ. And that conversation uh, continues starting in verse number 18. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he, uh, Peter, so Jesus said this to show what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So, before I state point number one, I just want to point out at least one thing. So, part of the restoration of Peter that we talked so much about last week is simply that Jesus is saying that Peter will, Peter will die a martyr's death. He, says, he said these things to show what kind of death he was going to glorify God. So this is part of the restoration of the Apostle Peter, basically, because he is declaring publicly that Peter will glorify Christ. He will glorify God through his death. But now let me back up to point number one. Number one, following Jesus requires a sober submission to his will. Following Jesus requires a sober submission to his will. And we see this because Jesus specifically prophesies that Peter himself, and he makes this comparison to when he is old and when he is young. When he is young, he could go wherever he wanted, he could do whatever he wanted to. However, when he is old, he will stretch out his hands, someone else will dress him and carry him where he does not want to go. Now, it's easy to kind of interpret that as a comparison between youth and old age. Most of you guys are aware that we take care of my dad, and I help him get dressed every morning. Um, in his old age, that has become difficult for him. This is not primarily a comparison of youthful vigor and sort of the decrepitude of old age. That is not primarily what this is. In the New Testament times, 
When somebody said, you will stretch out your hands, it meant one thing very specifically. It meant that you would be crucified. So, we sometimes do this same kind of thing. We speak of something that is very dark and difficult, euphemistically, right? So, you guys know that for about 10 years I was a, um, a jail chaplain. And sometimes people spoke of being incarcerated as going to the big house. Right? Okay? I'm, I'm going to have to go to the big house. Which is kind of a cute way of saying, I'm going to prison. Right? I mean, it's, it's not a cute thing. We would speak of a dark and difficult thing in a way that is um, less dark and difficult. And so, in the New Testament era, people would say, he had to stretch out his hands. And that meant that he went through the horror and the pain and the, uh, really, the, the torture of crucifixion. And so when Jesus says, you will stretch out your hands and you will go where someone doesn't want you to go or where you don't want to go, he means you will die by going to a cross, to your own cross. So in chapter 18, there is this distinction between Peter and Jesus. Jesus is faithful. Jesus says, I am He. And, and Peter denies Christ. In chapter 21, there is a similarity between Peter and Jesus. Peter will glorify the Father just like Jesus glorified the Father by going to a cross. And the amazing human drama of this is that Peter lived for another 30 years. I don't really know about you, but I don't exactly want to know, not yet, I don't want to know how I'm going to die. I'm 48 years old, I might have another 30 or so years. I don't want to live the next 30 years of my life knowing how I'm going to die. But Peter did. And Peter knew that it was going to be torture. It was going to be uh, scandalous. He knew that it was going to be the greatest pain that he would ever experience. Peter was beaten in the, the book of Acts. But that was nothing compared. That was nothing compared to what he knew that he was going to experience. He kind of wore this shadow of knowing that he was going to be crucified at the end of his life. And so, um, he has to follow Christ. He has to uh, soberly submit to the will of God in his life, knowing that the will of God for him was martyrdom on a cross. And Jesus ends this all with, after having said this to him, at the end of verse number 19, follow me. Follow me. Now, when he is speaking to Peter, what actually happens is they get up and they walk away. They walk away from the larger group. So there's this public display of a conversation between Jesus and Peter, and then there is going to be a private walk. But this is not just. In the context of the New Testament, we can't say that when Jesus says, follow me, he means, let's go for a private walk. And that's all that he means. Right? How did Peter start his discipleship? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. So why don't we turn to Matthew chapter 4 quickly. One of the things that I love about preaching with people actually here is that you, you turn in your Bibles. And I don't know whether you were turning in your Bibles when you were in the living room or not. Right? <laughs> But here you have the social pressure of me watching you either turn or not turn in your Bibles, right? And, and last week, you know, praise the Lord for every opportunity that we have to worship, but last week felt like a fiasco for me. You know, I had not prepared for wind in my service, right? And so I couldn't hold on to my notes in my Bible and have you turn to places in the Scriptures because I couldn't turn to places in the Scriptures. But nevertheless... Um, here you have um, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and in verse number 18, we'll read a couple of things where Jesus interacts again with Peter. And he, Peter gets up and, and follows. So this is Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, whose brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And so his discipleship begins with following the Lord Jesus Christ. And then if you turn over to Matthew chapter 16, and this applies to every disciple, this is 
a, um, this is all of the 12, and of course it applies to us as well. Um, Matthew chapter 16, verse number 24. Verse number 24. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And as it turns out, as it turns out, he is just, this is just after Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and also he says, you know, oh, surely you're not going to die. Surely you're not going to go to a cross. He rebukes Jesus. You know this part of the story. And Jesus then turns around and says to him, get behind me, Satan. And then he says to all of the disciples, if you want to follow me, it's going to cost you. There must be a sober submission to the will of God if we are going to follow Jesus Christ. So following Jesus for the disciples and for us means learning and listening. It is literally following Him and paying attention and learning and growing in our understanding of His Word and His truth and His expectations. It means submission and obedience. It also means relationship. Following Jesus means relationship. It, it means relationship simply because the twelve, they actually, literally, followed Jesus around for three years. They ate with Him. They slept in the, under the stars with Him. So, I mean, they had plenty of campfires together. There was literal fellowship and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It means leaving behind lesser priorities. For Peter and Andrew, in Matthew chapter 4... It says that they left their nets immediately. They left their boats. They left behind lesser priorities. And we have to do that. To follow the Lord Jesus Christ, we must prioritize our lives around Him. And it means sacrifice. And sometimes, sometimes following Jesus may mean, as it did for Peter and the other apostles, the ultimate sacrifice. We also have to be willing to take up our cross and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So bottom line, if we are going to follow Christ, it means that we must submit, we must obey, our attitude must be, yes, Lord, your will be done, and he must be our highest priority. You know, we are so casual, we are so casual about what it means to follow somebody. When we say that we follow somebody, it often means that we just pay attention to kind of their lives, or maybe more or less it means that we pay attention to their online presence. So, um, I know, you guys already know that I'm kind of weird, right? Okay, you guys already know that, so this isn't a big confession on my part, but there is a YouTuber that I follow, right? And I watch his journeys around the United States as he travels, as he does overlanding. Some of you may know what that's all about. But, so I follow this guy named Chris Schatz, okay? But what does that mean? Have I ever given him any money? No, you can if you want, right? You could be a Patreon follower, right? And you could give him money, but have I? No, I haven't. That's, there's no commitment on my part. I just watch his videos. And following, of course, is a Facebook terminology also, right? You could follow someone on Facebook. You could follow our church on Facebook if you want to. Right? And so we are so very casual about what it means to follow. But following Jesus means commitment. And also, let me say it this way, following Jesus meets the greatest needs of our hearts. So I've also mentioned this several times. As we have been quarantining ourselves um, and kind of having some extra time to read, I've been rereading the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And there's a point in the second volume, The Two Towers, where Sam follows Frodo. If you're familiar with the story at all, you know that the, kind of the, the main hero is Frodo and he's carrying the ring. He's going to go destroy this ring. And Sam it was his gardener. And he ends up being one of his traveling companions. And everybody else, Frodo has to leave the group. He has to leave the fellowship of the ring. And uh, only one man follows him and it's, and it's Sam. And Sam, they actually think that they're ultimately going to go to their death. They think that they will pay the ultimate sacrifice for this quest. But why does Sam follow Frodo? I think that Sam follows Frodo because he needs to. He needs to be with his dearest and closest friend. And so following Jesus, number one, is not, it is not a casual thing. But it is the greatest need of your life. And it is the greatest need of my life too. Because we need to be with our dearest and closest friend who is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He is a friend of sinners. We need to follow him. Now that leads us to turn our attention to verse 20, down to verse number 22. 20 to 22. So Jesus says, follow me. And they do, and Peter does. Peter gets up, and, and they seem to walk away, just the two of them. And Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. Now, boys and girls, we have been over this and over this and over this, but who is the, the disciple that Jesus loved? Does anybody know? It's, it's John. It's John the Apostle. And we could talk about the details of how we know that in another time, but he sees this disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The one who had been reclining at table close to him and had said, Lord, who is, that, who is it that is going to betray you? Now, that's kind of an interesting little detail to stick in there. And I, re I believe that the reason that it's stuck in there is John the Apostle is the disciple that Jesus loved, right? Okay, so he has an especially close relationship with Jesus. And so therefore we should believe his testimony when he writes it down at the end of his life. And also, does anybody know, by the way, why John asked, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? Does anybody know why? This is like a, a youth group, Sunday school class question. Does it, do any of our young people know this, the answer to this difficult question? No. Does Pastor Tom know? <laughs> no? Okay. So, does Don know? Don Delabon, do you know why John asked the question, who is it that's going to betray you? Does anybody? we got a children's Sunday school teacher in here that knows this. <laughs> Come on now. I would, I would, oh, wait, wait. I would guess maybe he was kind of ruined Peter or just kind of one of the... Oh, yes. Lance knows. I, 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 I think they were kind of... At each other's throat all the time. Okay, all right. Let me let me see. What does Brianna say? Um, I was gonna guess. Was he afraid that maybe it would be? Him? Maybe it would be him. Yeah, I think all of them were wondering. Oh no, is this gonna be me? That's a great guess. But here's the answer. I'll give you the answer to the question. So, it is recorded in chapter 13 that because Peter signaled, Peter signaled to John. John asked the question. Who is it that is going to betray him? And so we get the picture here that it's okay for John the Apostle to be following in this private conversation of Peter and Jesus because those two guys were tight, and they were tight, right? We see them together throughout the, the book of Acts. And so um, we should believe what John writes here about Jesus primarily and a little bit about Peter also because he was close to both of them. Now verse number 21. When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Like, he has just been told he is going to be crucified. And he says, well, what about this man? What about John the Apostle? Verse number 22, Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? And then he says it again, you follow me. So again, we have the priority of following the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me go down to point number two in the outline. Number two, as it turns out, and I didn't quite know how to say this, right? So here it is, kind of bald and blunt. Um, as it turns out, that's none of your business, right? There are a lot of things that are just not any of our business. If it is God's will for some people to die a martyr's death, to suffer excruciating pain, and to even go to the cross for Him, and if it is God's will for some other of His disciples to live out a naturally long life and experience a different pathway, that's up to God. What is that to you, Jesus says? What is that to you? So, well, sometimes we need to be reminded that God's will directs different Christians down different paths of life, and the differences are none of our business. Right? And I think also sometimes we need to realize that for us to follow the will of God, we need to have a little bit of spiritual blinders on. We need to kind of be able to say, this is God's will for me, and I don't really know what the pathway is for some other Christians. Some Christians may come to a level of maturity earlier or later than others. Some may learn lessons in life early that other people will never learn. And we must entrust Jesus' disciples to Jesus. 
And not compare. Not worry. We need to have a little bit of an attitude of, that's not any of my business. It's none of my business. Sometimes. Now, of course, if there is a brother or sister that is in flagrant disobedience to the will of God, things like the things that are listed in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, things like immorality and idolatry and um, drunkenness, things like that, those kinds of things, we have a responsibility as a community of faith to confront one another over flagrant disobediences to God's will. But there are other areas where we have to have a little bit of spiritual blinders on. Some people may suffer more or less than you or me. And yet, God, we need to leave that between God and them. And then that brings us to kind of an interesting and almost unusual passage in verse number 23. And just so that we can cover all of the verses, I'm going to read verses 23 to 24. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple, John, was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say that he was not to die. But if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Now, verse number 24, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And so point number three, end-time speculations don't help us follow Jesus. End-time speculations don't help us follow Jesus. So let me explain what's going on here. Because from our perspective, there have been 2,000 years since Jesus spoke these words to the Apostle Peter and uh, about the Apostle John. For us, it's easy to interpret this as if Jesus is saying, what's the big deal if I want him to live for century upon century upon century until I come back? Then what's the big deal to you? That's between me and him. But from the early church perspective, from the first century perspective, there were Christians going around saying... Jesus is going to come back before John the Apostle dies. Jesus is going to come back before John the Apostle dies. That's what they were saying. Which, by the way, sounds a little bit familiar because at least two Christian leaders have said that about themselves in this generation. But I will try not to chase that rabbit. <laughs> okay? Um, and so, so there, were, there were Christians. And the older John got... The older John got, what do you think was going on in those circles that were making these end time speculations? They were getting themselves into a fever pitch of expectation of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John the Apostle just, he records this little thing so that he can set the record straight. And he does so by saying, if it is my will, what is that to you? He repeats what Jesus is saying here. So that people get the message. This was a hypothetical, right? And you have no business speculating about whether Jesus is going to return before or after the Apostle John passes away. He's, he's setting the record straight. He's quoting accurately what the Lord Jesus Christ said, and he is repeating it. Now, this has application today, does it not? I sat down with a friend of mine yesterday. And he said, you know, I never saw, thought I would see the day. But with all of this going on with COVID-19, he said, man, we're reading the book of Revelation. You know? And so, uh, please don't throw any hymnals at me. But we have to be clear about this. In Revelation chapter 6, there is the record of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the four horses of the apocalypse, right? And there's a red one and a black one and a pale horse. And the pale horse, the pale horse is given the power of pestilence. It's given the power of pestilence. And so it is natural, it is natural to ask ourselves, is COVID-19 the beginning of the end times, Revelation chapter 6, pestilence? It is natural to ask ourselves that kind of question. Okay? Now, I, I will back up and say, I reviewed a little bit. I reviewed Matthew chapter 24. And I reviewed some other passages in Scripture as well. 
And pestilence itself isn't mentioned that often as we look forward to the end times. It's, it is mentioned, but it's not mentioned as often as some other things, especially war, right, and some other things. It's natural to ask those questions, but what is the answer to the question, Pastor Tom? The answer is, we don't know, right? We don't know. It, I think you said, don't ask that question, right? We don't know the answer. It's natural to ask that question, but we really don't know the answer. So an illustration of that would simply be the bubonic plague or the black plague in the Middle Ages. Would it have been easy to ask the question? Would it have been easy to think that the black plague was the beginning of the end times during the Middle Ages? Yes, absolutely. At least one-fourth of the population of Europe died. Am I accurate on that? I think so. I think it's at least one-fourth of the population of Europe died. You're an American history guy, right? Okay. Um, be, because of the Black Plague. They all thought it was the, the end times. They thought it was the tribulation, yes. And there has been 500 years of history since. So we don't know the future. So here, let me say this very clearly. End time speculations do not help us follow Jesus, but faithfulness and preparedness do. Faithfulness and being prepared, living every day, living every day as if Christ is coming back today. Those kinds of things help us follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we come finally to this final verse in the Gospel of John. John chapter 21, verse number 25. It is as if, for the sake of setting the record straight and kind of resolving an issue, John the Apostle has had to speak about himself very briefly for a couple of verses. And now in verse 25, he can't end the book that way. He cannot end the book focused on himself. He must focus on the Lord Jesus. And so verse 25, he says this, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did, where every one of them were to be written down. I suppose that the whole world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So instead of focusing on himself and correcting the record, he focuses on number four, the cosmic glory and greatness of Jesus Christ. The cosmic glory and greatness of Jesus Christ. Yes, there are many things. There are many things that Jesus did on his, during his earthly ministry that are not recorded in this book. But we need to remember the things we do need to know are recorded. The things that we do need to know are recorded. The way that J.C. Ryle interpreted this passage was is that the human race is full enough of the knowledge of what Jesus did that any more would not benefit us. You know enough in the New Testament to trust in this great and glorious Jesus. But what I think, I think a, a better interpretation actually of verse number 25 is that John the Apostle is, he is looking backward and he is looking all the way back to John chapter 1, verse number 1, where he said, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And he is saying, you know what, you cannot contain in this world, you cannot contain the eternal glory and greatness of all that Jesus is and all that Jesus has done. So if you go back to in the beginning was the Word, then you have to recognize that Jesus is the eternal Word of God communicating all down through the ages. You have to recognize that He is the divine Son existing in love and fellowship with the Father and the Spirit. You have to recognize that He is the divine instrument of all of creation. That when it was in the beginning was the Word, it also was in the beginning, he, it, the world was made by Him. Also, we have to realize that He is the rock of Israel, following Israel through the wilderness, providing for them as they go and protecting them. We have to realize that He is the Son of God incarnate in the womb of Mary. Come in the flesh. He is the revelation of the glory and grace of God. That's also John chapter 1, isn't it? We have seen His glory. We have seen the glory of the only begotten of the Father. 
He is the Redeemer. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the dying and risen Lord. And He is the returning and reigning King. He is worth following. He is worth following. That is why we follow Him. He is a King. He is a Master. He is a leader. He is a teacher. He is worth obeying. He is worth submitting to. He is worth getting to know in fellowship, learning from, and building my life around. So the ultimate question of the entire Gospel of John is, will you follow Him? Will you follow Him? Will you follow Jesus? Will we submit and serve and obey? Will we be faithful over a lifetime? Will we leave uh, the lives of Jesus' other followers in His hands? Will we um, look for His coming? Will we believe His words? Will we trust Him? Will we die for Him if need be? Will we love Him and fellowship with Him? He is absolutely worth following. Let's pray again. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, thank You. Thank You that we could be here. Thank You that we could sort of glance backward into the uh, closing moments of the Gospel of John and see this conversation that takes place and, and hear the ringing crescendo in the heart of the Gospel of John of the glory and greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So glorious, so great that all of the world cannot contain all that He is and all that He has done. Oh Lord, may it be that we would follow You Lord Jesus, we love you, and may it be that we would follow you with faithfulness and grace in our lives, and may our lives demonstrate that. May we trust you with the lives of your other followers, may we trust you with the timing of your coming, and Lord, may we submit and obey and serve. May it be, O oh God, that we here would be willing to make that ultimate sacrifice of submitting to your will, even if it means in our situation, suffering and even death. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, once again, would you stand with us as we close out the singing? And then after we have sung, I'll come back and have a time of dismissal. <coughs>
once again, what a delight and a blessing it has been to just uh, be here with you and to worship the Lord together. We would like to ask that uh, you uh, not just all rush out, um, maybe just be seated right now, and um, and the, the ushers are going to dismiss you, so if you can just be uh, be seated, they'll dismiss you. Um, I'm going to sit, at the, I'm going to stand at the back and just say goodbye as you go. Um, and you can spread out in the hallways if you need to. Um, just hang around and visit if you would like. And of course, be respectful of those who would like to just move on through and go to their cars. God bless you. You're dismissed.